Hello, uh, this is, um, my name is Lisa Power, and this is a little chat that I'm having with someone I have known for many years for LGBT History Month for Pride Cymru's YouTube account. So um, that's where you'll be looking at it now if you're watching. And I would like to introduce you to my very good friend, um, Gary Bruff. Gary, tell us a bit about yourself now and what you're doing. Uh, thanks, Lisa. So uh, my name is Gary, and I'm a, I'm a born and brought, bred Welshman from the Rhondda Valleys, um, who moved to London in 1985. Uh, and today, um, I work for Positively UK, which is the UK's leading HIV peer support organisation. Uh, and I'm lead for peer learning partnerships and policy. So I deal with uh, training our staff, our peer support volunteers, um, our national program of peer mentors, uh, and then the partnership work that we do with other voluntary sector organizations uh, and clinics as well. And that's currently where I'm at. And I asked to talk to you for this History Month because um, I, I assume that you've, you've now seen It's a Sin, and we'll talk about the program in a minute, but I kind of, I like to think, um, and by the time this gets out, it won't be a spoiler, but I like to think that if Colin had survived, that he would have been you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that he would have kind of been the kind of person who wanted to make things better for everybody and who came forward eventually, conquered his shyness. Yes. <laughs> no, so I appreciate that. You're my Colin who survived, but... <laughs> yes. Have you, you've seen the program, haven't you? I have. I, I, I watched it. Uh, I watched it episodes one and two on the Friday. Um, because of your advice, I didn't binge it. I, I watched episode three on the Saturday, and then on Monday, I did four and five together. Which, with hindsight, maybe one at a time would have been better. But you know, and I've it's now Friday, and I've spent five days pretty much on the verge of tears at various points, just because of the recall and the 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 emotional impact that it had on me. I wasn't quite expecting to be uh, as affected as I was by the programme. What did you think of it, apart from it being quite traumatic and upsetting, yeah? I adored it. I absolutely adored it. it I have never seen anything that spoke more clearly to my experience, that understood me so well, and that reflected my life um, through the 80s, moving to London, um, and dealing with HIV and AIDS. Luckily, you know, I was, I was a few years after that when, when I moved to London, was 85. But um, from kind of episode two, three onwards, that was, that was a lot of my experience. Um, and so, you know, it, it, was, it was wonderful to, to feel like I was back in heaven and the various other clubs and listening to the music that I'd started listening to down in the tunnel in Cardiff back in 80, 83, 84. Um, and those periods that, that, that resonated so much. So the music, the humour, the gallows humour, especially, um, uh, which, uh, you know, was, was a survival mechanism. You know, if you didn't laugh, you'd cry. And, and we, were, we were cried out for a lot of that time. So um, I loved the balance that it struck. Um, but I, I don't remember the last time, if ever, that I sat in, a living, in my living room and wailed as I did um, yeah. in that last episode, particularly where, um, where, you know, the mother uh, told Jill that he died the day before you would think there was going to be this last moment of, of reconnection and that the, you know, her wishes and his would be respected. And then it was snatched away. And that finished me completely. The, 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 the issue of between that generation gap and the, 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 the whole zest for life of that younger generation in the face of something so terrible and a complete lack of understanding from the, the, the parents. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it was episode three that got me because I, I had a pretty good friend who died with toxoplasmosis and who was, you know, was incoherent, was coming in and out, was speaking in different languages in the same sentence, yeah. um, doing all of those things. Um, so that was, that was the one where I, suddenly realized I had things I clearly hadn't unpacked. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So if there are any of you out there who were around at the time and you haven't watched the series yet, be careful of your mental health because you just need to take it in bits. Don't try and push yourself. I, I know people 
you know, had nightmares. And yet at the same time, we all thought it was absolutely brilliant. Yeah. yeah. That's what's weird. Yeah. Um, and it was so, universally yeah. well acted. That's the other thing. The performers, every one of them uh, was phenomenal. Um, I, I identified so much with so many of the perspectives. You know, that was the, the great thing. They managed to get really everything in there that you could have wanted. Um, uh, although clearly there has been some criticism from uh, that there wasn't much uh, trans representation, there wasn't much representation of lesbians, uh, and clearly both groups were very much involved and active at that time. But I get the point that when you started AD1 and you're following a group of gay friends, that that's the story you're telling, and you know then there's not always the scope for being fully as fully inclusive as you may want to be. And as someone who was there then, there weren't that many trans people within the gay community. I mean, there were drag queens, but not trans people. Yeah. Um, and I will fight to the death to claim that um, the, the solicitor in it um, was, a, she's, she's a dyke. That, that uh, Muslim solicitor in it is definitely a lesbian. And Russell says so too. Okay. So there you go. <laughs> it's just that she hasn't got it emblazoned across her forehead. Yeah. <laughs> um, so t you, you were a lad from the Valleys and initially you went to Cardiff. Tell us a bit about your, your evolution as, as the next Colin, as it were. <laughs> well, the evolution was a slightly different to Colin's because I was, I was, uh, um, I was a gay goth in the Valleys, which in the, in the early 80s was, was not a thing to do. Um, I'm, I'm from Mardi at the, the head of the Ronda, uh, right as far as you can go before you hit the, what used to be the coal mine and then the reservoir. Uh, so a small mining village still in the 80s. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I kind of figured that I was the only gay in the village, to, to use a, a cliche now. Um, but I was certainly the only gay goth in the village. Um, so it was the early 80s. I was, I was into new romantic and goth music. And so I grew my hair. I bleached it. I dyed it black. Uh, I wore makeup. And that gave me a lot of trouble. Uh, uh, but then at the age of 17, I, find, uh, I found out from one of my goth friends who was going down to Cardiff on the weekends to uh, um, uh, a goth club called Nero's that there was also a gay club called Tunnel that was there. And she said um, one of her friends drove her down on the weekend who was from Ferndale, which is just next door, uh, and would I like to go sometime? And so I, I said, hell yes, I would. Uh, and so I met up with somebody that I'd seen at school um, for the few years before who was a year older than me um, and who scared the living daylights out of me because he was very camp. Uh, and, and although I was relatively camp myself, I wasn't very confident and, you know, uh, it, it wasn't a happy time for me. And, and so I, I just kept to myself very much. So we went, he took us down to, to Cardiff and we went to the tunnel um, uh, we went to the Kings first and, and the Terminus, uh, and I met gay people, gay Welsh people for the first time. Um, and it was, uh, it was astonishing. It was the most exciting time. Um, it was at a time where obviously, you know, I was, I was 16, 17. Um, I'd known for several years that I was gay. Um, but there was really no opportunity uh, for me to be able to explore that in the valleys. Um, I know that other people say they did differently and they, they you know, they fooled around with, with boys their own age and things and that. I never did that. I never uh, had the guts or the luck to, for it to happen. So Cardiff was my first opportunity. And so for the year and a half before I finished my A-levels, uh, I went out on the, the gay scene and the terminus was the intersection between the gay and the goth scene. It was a bit alternative and... Um, and so there was, there, was, there was as much gay as goth representation. And the two groups mixed together very well because we were all freaks in, in that time, you know? Um, I'm going to steal, steal, if you've got any photographs of that time, we need them for Lost LGBT Cardiff, which is the other project we're doing. It, funny enough, I've just been sent a couple of photographs um, from a friend. It, it's the year after, it's the year after I moved to London. But um, my friend Dave, who I was living with in a house very much like the one in It's a Sin, uh, but, but a bit less gay. Um, and, and we drove down, he drove us down to Cardiff for the weekend. Uh, and then we took the train down from the valleys to go, to go to the club. And there's a photograph of me and my four best girlfriends, all of us with our big black back-combed hair on the, uh, on the valleys line going down from Porth 
down to down to Cardiff's and then a couple of us in in Nero's as well. So I can I can get those photos to you. That would be great. So you you did the bright lights of Cardiff. Yes. And then like a lot of lads from a, a lot of different places in Wales, you decided to try and make it in London. Yes. So I, I got a, I got an opportunity to go to college. And my first choice was Brighton, but I didn't get the grades. And so fortuitously, I ended up in London. I'm glad to say I love Brighton, but London was where I was meant to be. And so in 85, in September of 85, I moved to London. Um, and my uh, halls of residence for university were literally on the street off Oxford Street. So I was in central London. The rent was £20 a week. Um, and I had a grant because I was, you know, I, I was from the South Wales Valley. We were, we were poor. My father had been made redundant from his work in the, in the factory, in the bookbinding factory. And so I had a grant, uh, a place to live. Uh, and I was thrown into London and the, the combination of the gay and the goth scene there as well. Although admittedly, when I got there, I did take my parents' advice having come out to them the, the year before, that maybe I should just try and be normal when I got there and give it a fresh start. Maybe it was just a phase. And so I cut all my hair short into a flat top. My mum bought me a, um, a, a sweatshirt and some jeans and a pair of trainers for the first time in my life. Uh, and I wore these and it, it was the most uncomfortable drag I've ever worn in my life. And uh, I, I remember going in to try and cash my student grant in, in the NatWest Bank uh, and a man behind me, and there I am all butched up in my sweatshirt and my jeans and my flat top. And a man behind me said, excuse me, miss, can I get past that at all? I won't swear because we're on a public channel. But I thought, damn it, that's it. And, and that, that, the end of that week, I went to uh, Topshop and Miss Selfridges. I bought myself some new goth outfits um, and got the makeup out again. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you were a gay goth on the London scene? Gay goth, yes. I grew the hair back and ended up with the full Susie and the Banshees slash Pete Burns Dead or Alive look. They were my icons. And did you have parties like the ones in It's a Sin? Very much so. so <laughs> the, 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 we lived in, we lived in, a, in various uh, student flat shares, including a, a, an electricity-free squat in Pimlico, which we shared with a, with a bunch of National Front skinheads two of whom were gay, it turns out, which was rather bizarre, but they, you know, so they were, they were National Front skinheads, but not of the usual kind you expected. But it was a challenge for me and my best friend because it, we were goths and we needed to crimp our hair and you can't crimp your hair with a candle. So we used to have to go to friends to, to get the crimpers before we went out. And then we got a, a whole house together in Balham in South London. Um, and so there's six of us um, in a big three-story Victorian house uh, and we threw huge parties. Uh, regularly um, and there are still people on Facebook today that can touch and they go, oh I remember those parties in Balham um, <laughs> and so yeah it was it was a wild time uh, we never did turns though that's the thing so you always had music and you had different music in different rooms and places but I never did the uh, come and do a turn and sing la or anything like that <laughs> but by this stage you progressed beyond Colin in the corner and you were a bit more lively I think I was uh, I, wasn't, I wasn't any more confident about my sexual attractiveness because a gay goth wasn't really the most sought after, uh, you know, gay in the village in terms of Cardiff, uh, in London life. You know, it was the same in Cardiff. There were, there were a couple of alternative gay guys who I clicked with. But in, generally in the club, as it was in, in London, um, you know, a man in makeup was not really the, the person that was going to be sought after sexually. And I had no self-confidence. Um, and so the one thing that didn't reflect my, my experience was those parties and then opening doors of rooms and people having sex. It's like, oh God, I, I couldn't tell. Well, I could tell you. It probably wasn't until my mid-30s that I had my first threesome. So it was, uh, <laughs> it was, that, was, that was where we departed ways. But obviously in 85, uh, there was a lot more awareness and there was a lot more anxiety already uh, about HIV. And so... So, you know, I, it, was, it was a standard given that condoms were going to be used and um, you, you were, that I wasn't going to be able to sleep around or do anything. You know, there was my experience when I told my parents, the first thing was, well, oh, my God, you've got to be careful, HIV. Um, and I think, you know, there were several generations of us from the mm -hmm. early 80s onwards that had that response when we told our parents. And it was a valid response, you know, in terms of their anxiety and our own anxiety, um, you know, it, it, 
you always thought about it whenever you met somebody and you're going home and in those days, I didn't necessarily even think about sex, sex. It would be having a kiss and a cuddle. And, you know, it, it wasn't, it wasn't the, the, the sex that I became accustomed to. Um, but, you know, it was, it, those were different times in many ways. Uh, yeah. But you've given a couple of hints in what you said that um, you did blossom as things went on. <laughs> I, I, I blossomed post-treatment, actually, because that's the thing. It was only, it was only after recovering from uh, HIV and, and the various AIDS-related conditions when I was, it was only after having treatment that I suddenly realized that there, were, there, there was no point in me being a shy, retiring wallflower and being, um, you know, be, th th there was something about losing, almost losing your life that gave me a, a, a level of, not devil may care attitude, but a level of bravado in the sense of, no, if you want something, Life is short and you have to live it and enjoy it and do what you want to do. Uh, and so, you know, it was always the thing that if you, whatever you do safely, then there's, that, that's fine. And so it took me a long time to get there. Well, let's take you back a little bit and take you back to in finding out that you had HIV in London. Yeah. And how did, how did you feel about that and how did you handle it? Well, I came in the year that the tests came out. So um, the first time I went for a sexual health test in London at the end of 85, they offered me an HIV test. And so I thought, well, it's better to know than not to know, surely, isn't it? And, and took the test. It was only afterwards when I talked to various friends and people on the gay scene, they said, oh, my God, no, I'm not testing. Why would you want to know? And it hadn't occurred to me. I, I, I'm very much of the opinion today, as I was then, that knowledge is power. Um, uh, but, the, but most people didn't want to know at that point. Um, and I understand that. I understand that, you know, just the, the, what would that would mean to know that day to day. But for me, the fear of not knowing it a day to day felt worse. So I tested in 85 uh, and it was negative. And each year I tested and it was negative. Um, by the time I tested in 91, I'd, I'd got a little bit out of hand, I'll be fair. I'd, I was drinking too much. Um, I hadn't realized the extent to which my lack of self-esteem was down to internalized homophobia. How my upbringing, how the, the abuse, the, the bullying, the, the name calling that I got every day at school had really, you know, sort of sunk into me and taken hold somewhere. And so my only way of having confidence when I went out to, the, to clubs and particularly to gay clubs Less so with the goths, because I wasn't out there hoping to date. I was out there to dance. But with the gay clubs, I needed a drink just to be able to talk to people because I had no confidence. And so by the time we got to my last year at college, I was drinking on a daily basis and having real problems. And so um, I stopped drinking in 1990. And we did my final year. And during that final year, ridiculously, was diagnosed with HIV. And it turns out that between the test in May the year before uh, and me stopping drinking six weeks later, um, in that six-week period, I contracted HIV. So it was a huge shock. Um, I was furious because I felt that I'd made the right choices and then it felt like I was being um, punished unnecessarily, having made all the right choices afterwards. Um, and they told me it was a five-year um, opportunity though that what I had was you know a couple of years of good health followed by probably a couple of years of deteriorating health but that within five years um, I'd be dead and I was 23 at the time so it was a uh, it was it was tough um, I didn't know what to do with it um, I didn't know I had no concept of what, what I could do with the future which is why that that first episode of it's a sin which ended on them going for their job interviews and various things. And they're saying, so where do you see yourself in five years? What do you think you'll be doing in 10 years? That, in that first episode, destroyed me. And I just sat there sobbing because I remember, not the diagnosis, because I have no recollection of what they said, but I, I knew at that point that I had less than five years left to live and there would be no more life. And so it really, that really struck me hard, that first episode. Um, I was lucky, I, you know, I was living in a, in a big house share with my friends still, um, and I just went home and told them. Um, most people I know, again, who were diagnosed after that, 
they spent a lot of time dealing with it by, by themselves. They didn't, they didn't have friends or family or support. But um, I went back and, and told my flatmates because I, I had no judgment about um, what it meant to have HIV. It was you were unlucky if you'd managed to catch it. But you, it, wasn't, it wasn't something that you should feel blamed for or guilt about. It was, it was bad luck. And so I went home and told my friends and they supported me. And I did the same thing with my parents and they supported me. Uh, and I think it's quite unusual for that time. I mean, I know the level of rejection there was for people. Um, but I was very, very lucky that people around, rallied around me and supported me through those uh, years. I think that's true. But also one of the things that I observed over the years was very much that people who felt bad about their diagnosis, who were guilty in themselves, yeah. were more likely to tell people in a way that those other people would then head in the direction of guilt tripping them or being difficult. And it's not to blame the person with HIV, but if, if you're not confident about something and you don't transmit that confidence, yeah. then you do invite at the very best sympathy yeah. um, and at the worst, you know, bad reactions. Yeah. Um, and so the people I know who like you just went home and blurted it out actually on the whole, not everyone, but on the whole had a better go of it. And it's a bit like, I've always said the same thing about coming out as lesbian or gay, or these days, any other variety of queer, that if you're confident, you will carry at least some of those people with you. Um, but that's a hard sell to somebody who's sitting there freaked out completely about something they never wanted to believe about themselves at the time. Yeah. Yeah, it, the, that that uh, moment in I think it was episode two where um, Gloria says, "Don't tell him." Well, I, I I I I'm not a slut. I don't want him to think I'm a slut. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was that there was still that 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 level of judgment that oh, if you got that, oh, you must have been all over the place with everyone, you know. Uh, and I was so damn careful. Uh, not enough, clearly. But you know, it, it, it was that was the that was the environment and the the level of judgment there was and still is in the gay community around HIV as a, a as a uh, some kind of a, a stigma mark. You know, it's yeah, it's hard. So you went home, you told your friends, and presumably you carried on working. So I, I was in my final year of college. So that was that was in the in the February of ninety one. Um, so I'm, I'm just coming up to my 30 year anniversary in a couple of weeks. Wow. Um, and I did, I did my finals and miraculously got through my finals and passed. Um, I had a choice at that point, you know, the recommendations really from the clinic and from most people were to, if you're in a job, pack it in, cash in your pension, cash in your life insurance, do Disney world or whatever it is that is your bag that you'd like to do before you die and get it done now. Cause you're not going to be well enough to do it soon. And it it didn't sit well with me. I I couldn't do that, you know. I'm from I'm from Mardi, and you know it it was known locally as Little Moscow, which tells you something about the politics in the 80s. There, I had a very strong socialist upbringing, so the idea of just going on to benefits and not doing anything, I was like, oh no 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 no, I've got to do something. And so so I went. I started to to go to work, um, and I just the other thing was. It, I went along to the to one agency where there was a, a, a drop in support uh, and it was a very uh, well respected, well known HIV support organization. And I went with my best friend and we went through the doors and, and we were in, they had a volunteer to show you around the premises and oh, oh, this is this is the lounge and we'll be having bingo this afternoon and here's the, the cafeteria and we'll be doing that and there's treatment rooms here. And then this volunteer started to regale us with stories about all of the terrible things that had happened to him since he was diagnosed and the problems with AIDS and the different things. And, uh, and bless him, the volunteer training back at that point clearly must have been not sufficient to talk about boundaries and, uh, and, to, and to not, how not to scare the hell out of people because we left there. My best friend burst into tears and said, please promise me you'll never go back there again. And I'm like, no, I'm not. And so at that point, I kind of, distanced myself from HIV support and, and went down a kind of an alternative route of, of things like the, um, the, the heel trust, the heel clinic and, and homeopathy. And I'd already refused AZT because that was offered to me. Um, and I thought, okay, I'm going to do what I can to stay well. 
Uh, and I'm just going to think about how I look after myself. And that means getting a job, getting on with life and focusing on my life and well-being and not worrying about HIV and AIDS. And so I think there's a very fine line between a positive attitude and denial. And I think I was pretty much on a knife edge for quite a lot of it. And for quite a bit of it, I was in denial as well. <laughs> <laughs> so you worked, you, you did alternative therapies. Mm -hmm. What persuaded you to start treatment in the end? Uh, a CD4 count of 10, a oh, year and a half of chemotherapy for, for, the, for this Kaposi's sarcoma that had started on my chest and went into my lungs. Uh, the fact that drinking my pee, as he did, as they mentioned in, the, the, in the, the, the show, and having tried every single alternative therapy, that play, you know, I was diagnosed in 91 and I got to 97 without treatment which was a good innings at that point, despite, you know, I was diagnosed with AIDS in 95. Um, but clearly it wasn't enough. Uh, but also clearly there was evidence, scientific evidence in 96 to show that it was working. And although I didn't jump at the chance then, I waited and, and watched friends get up from what was meant to be their deathbeds in those hospitals and were suddenly out clubbing and looking fantastic and feeling great. I mean, it was, a, it was a, just such a turnaround for so many people. They just leapt up and seemed well again. And so in 97, I said, okay, it's, it's time. I'll start treatment. Um, because I, I, there, was, there was no other choice. I knew that where I was going, you know, from my AIDS diagnosis, um, there was no coming back from that. And yet people were. And so that's what, that's what changed my mind. The, the, that, that, the lived experience is always what kind of yeah. draws me, which is why I'm still in peer support. Uh, and I wanted to see that with my own eyes and see people get well. And I did. And then you ended up actually working in the sector. Yeah. So the, the interesting thing was, is that I, I, I started on treatment uh, and then I got immune reconstitution syndrome, which put me back in hospital with pneumonia um, and actually was the closest I got to death, ironically, having started treatment. But I, I got well after that uh, and was referred to an exercise referral program for people with HIV at the YMCA in London. And that literally got me back on my feet. Um, my doctor had referred me. Um, and um, um, as I started to recover, um, my doctor said, look, we're looking at what the, the uh, services should be um, for, for the next century. It was 1999 at that point. We want to think about what's the HIV clinic for the 21st century, which seemed so science fiction at the time. Um, and, uh, and he pulled together a workshop day with the consultants, the nurses, the receptionists, the, the patients, the, the researchers, everybody that was involved in that clinic. He got representatives from each um, specialty, each, each group, and we all workshop together on a day as to what we wanted for the next century. And one of the things that kept coming up was patient involvement. The idea that if we're going to live, we need to have a say in how these services are, um, are, are, are shaped around us. Because like, like I think no other condition before, the response, the medical response to HIV had to be something that was was undoubtedly person-centered because you never know what was going to happen. You, 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 you know, I think the challenge of being my doctor for those years when they were trying to give us me the medications from the different trials and I was refusing resolutely. Uh, and, and each time I'd come back and tell them, you know, what weird thing I was going to be doing this month. Uh, you developed rapport and you worked in collaboration together. So to think about what the future would be like that, you couldn't just say, well, now that we've got treatment, we're not going to collaborate. You're just going to take your pills. Although I'm sure there's a lot of people that would like that. That wasn't going to happen with all of the bolshie gay men that had really held their own for those years. So I got involved with that. We put a, together a patient group and uh, uh, started to run workshops. Uh, and then I suggested if they, if they liked what we were doing and the, the, the feedback was fantastic, that we should actually put that peer support in the clinic um, uh, and, and really kind of um, legitimize it by putting a paid role in there. Because at that point in, 19, well, that was about 2000, 2001, the, um, the HIV support organizations were closing down. Um, a lot of the smaller ones that did the drop-ins, that did the, 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 the food, the social care, the, the, the massages, all of those, once there was effective treatment, were defunded and they started to disappear. So having peer support in the clinic, for me, was always the logical thing to do. 
And so I, I started working there and I started to also work at the, the YMCA. I, I retrained as a Pilates teacher just because when, once I got well, I didn't want to go back to my old job. It was, I had a great job in the film industry. I was very successful, but it meant nothing to me when I got well. I, I wanted to do something that I cared about. Uh, and what I saw as I was um, volunteering was that when I talked about what I'd been through and, and that I was okay now, it just made a connection to people. And the, the years of 12-step of, of programs and peer support that I got uh, in order to deal with my alcohol issues were just exactly the right fit for HIV peer support, I found as well. It's sharing the solutions and finding ways through together. And so that started in the late 90s, early 2000s, and it's now been more than 20 years. And I've, I've worked in clinics at Town Siggins Trust, at Positive UK, um, but always in peer support. One of the things that really struck me, I, we're talking now about what's happening now, um, is that here in, in Wales, we don't have any um, PLHIV support groups, um, not self-help groups, that is. Yeah. Um, and I know that Fast Track Cardiff and Vale very much want to change that. Um, it's very difficult down here. We have a very high level of late diagnosis and people are still very nervous to test. And we really need a lot of more, a lot more peer support to try and persuade people that there is benefit to being basically someone like you who just grabs life with both hands and gets on with it and refuses to be cowed by their diagnosis. And so, you know, what, what's your take on how, how difficult it is to get that kind of thing going? What's your take on why it's a good idea to have it? Because obviously you think that or you wouldn't still be doing it. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 <laughs> in the role previous to this one at Positive UK, I spent four years training up people to provide peer support across the UK. We had a four-year project. We trained over 700 people, um, including um, eight in Cardiff with THD Cymru. So we trained eight peer mentors to be able to provide support. Um, we worked with the, with the hospital in Cardiff to look at the, they obviously had the, the support worker from THD coming in once a week. Uh, and I, I had conversations with the lead clinician there about the potential to think about how they could do more with volunteers. They were very keen. THD Cymru came on board. We did the training. Um, and then obviously from my perspective, that the, the funding for that project ended in um, 2019. Uh, and so I must admit, I dropped out of touch in terms of what was happening there. I, I had this dream that you know the, this the peer support was still happening at THT Cymru and they was all working and I, clearly that's not the case in that way there, there are some individual peer support mentors there I wouldn't like to say I mean you know THT are trying to manage things even though they're very tiny here um, but I think there's a real issue around just community support yeah. um, in a wider sense and maybe that's that's what we have to tackle is is the willingness of people to say that clear message that you can live with HIV. There's still an awful lot of people here, including even on the gay scene, who really haven't got their heads around PrEP, around the fact that you can't pass it on if you're on successful mm -hmm. treatment. All of those messages um, are not so much happening here. So um, I'm going to be picking your brains after we finish this video. <laughs> well, it's, it's interesting. I came down to Cardiff in the 2000s when I was working for Terence Higgins Trust with you. Um, and I came down at the request of uh, one of the people from THT because they, they had uh, a few people who I'm sure the clinic would have seen as troublemakers um, who wanted to talk about things and who wanted to have some kind of group. And because I'd set up this patient network and the group within the clinic, um, I, 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 at that point, I was hopping around the country and talking to people about what they could do. And so it was, about, it was a bit of a kind of a rabble rousing activism thing about you can do this, you can pull together and have a group and do things. And so we met in the THT offices um, uh, down in Cardiff, the old THT offices. And uh, there were a few people from THT uh, and a few people who were there from the clinic who uh, uh, were all coming together. And, and they started to have a, a group that was much more about what they could connect with the clinic and have some activism. Um, but obviously, Fast forward 10 years when I came down to do the, the, the peer mentor training, all of that had, had kind of drifted a little bit. And it's hard. You know, activism isn't, uh, isn't an easy option. The, the commitment to, to get involved in those things, you know, with the, 
the patient network. I was involved for, for 20 years. I stepped down at the end of 2019 um, uh, and it's, it's not really functioning very well because you need that commitment and that energy all the time. Mm. Um, and it, it's, you, if, if that's how you want to, what you want to focus on in your life, then good luck. You'll do a great job at it. But if, if what you want to do is a little bit here and a little bit there, then that's not going to work for a point of view of really, uh, affecting long-term change. It's a, it's a huge commitment. Well, I have to say, I think my experience of the clinic here now, people are very, very together. And I think the clinic is very much on board with all of this now. So maybe now's the time to try again. Um, well, exactly. I mean, it's, you know, and we have, you have some role models in Wales, some very high, uh, high profile well, role models done. who've done it. You know, I, that, I, that documentary where um, the, the scenes, yeah. the scenes in, the, in the clinic and, him going for his yep. care and that and uh, it, it was so moving to me to see that I, I thought oh there's a chance here that we'll break through some of that stigma because I realize I'm in a really privileged position in London that I, I can be the benefit of being here is the is the potential for greater anonymity um, I know what it was like in Cardiff back in the 80s and I know what it is, was like in Brighton through some of those years as well that small gay scene um uh, where it's community, but it's also p the potential to be very gossipy, very bitchy, uh, and it, you've got to be—you re feel really careful. You, you know, you're not sure what you can do, what you can say, and all it takes is you hearing somebody gossiping about somebody else for you to think my secrets are not safe. Yeah, so that, that's the problem with the small town scenes. I think sometimes yeah. that we need to be a community. And I think what we need to also be concentrating on now is. We've got treatment. We know that we can keep people alive, but can people live well? Yeah. And I think to live well, you need to be confident in yourself. You know, and we need to start thinking about all of that and how we, how we help people not just to live, but to live a full life. Exactly. When you've been told for many years that, you know, you're scum in a variety of different ways yeah. and often by your own community. Yes. Some. It's hard to get up and say, oh, and I'm going to swear, sod you, I'm better than this. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the spirit we've got, to, we've got to try with. And I think, you know, it's listening to people like you that is really helpful for that. Well, thank you. I, I hope that having a level of inclusive LGBT uh, plus education at schools will be one of the things that will start to shift this and that future generations won't have to go through the shame, the guilt, the low self-esteem, the internalized stigma. Um, and the resultant STIs that come from not being empowered and taking charge and doing what you need to, to look after yourself and your community. Uh, and so I, I kind of hope that, we, that you know, we're on the right track. Um, but it's, it's hard, you know, and you, you see it now with COVID and, you know, they're, oh, well, I don't need to wear a mask. Uh, I'm not going to do this. So they, it, 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 we're humans and we're, we're, we're all flawed and different in different ways. And so how we come together and, and overcome those challenges is, is a, a constant enigma to me, but it's a, it's a battle worth fighting. Well, Gary, I think, you, you know, you've just demonstrated to us exactly how people can fight against challenges because you've done it. And I think, you know, you're a hero from the valleys and we need more of them, but, um, we'll celebrate the ones we have. So I'm very grateful to you for having this conversation with me. And I hope that we see a lot more of you in Cardiff. We're going to be dragging you down here. Oh, I'd love to. <laughs> I'd love to. My pleasure. Jochenbao. <laughs> Jochenbao, dear. Thank you very much. Thanks, Lisa.